Hello, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. Today we're going to be talking about the Cheshire County um, Historical Society. And my two guests are... I am Alan Rummerl, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. And I'm Carl Jacobs. I'm President of the Trustees of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. So, Alan, <clears throat> what got you involved in the, in the Historical Society? Well, it was pretty easy, actually, for me to get interested in local history because my family has lived in the town of Stoddard since 1770, so we have a long history there. My grandmother was volunteer curator of the Stoddard Historical Society, and she got me interested in this field when I was quite young, actually, so I always knew where I was headed. And the Board of Trustees, what is the Board of Trustees? The Board of Trustees is the governing body of the Historical Society. We set the budget and the overall policies for the Society going forward. And how big is the trustees? <laughs> Alan, was it 12, 15? We are normally 18, 18. members on the board. 18 members. And um, before we go to a film clip, which I've seen before and I was pretty impressed by, Cheshire County, I've never heard of a county historical society. It's always been like the Four River Histor Historical Society where I grew up in Lizzie Borden, but I've never heard of a county one. County historical societies are very rare in New England. It's usually, as you say, a town historical society. But when we were formed in 1927, the three people who started the society were from three different towns. So they decided to start a county-wide organization. And we're the only county historical society in New Hampshire. So we deal with all 23 communities in southwestern New Hampshire. So what we'll do right now, we'll go to your clip. It's about a seven-minute clip, seven, eight-minute clip. I think it's pretty awesome. I'm, I may be a little biased since I've seen it before. I'm pretty sure that you guys think it's pretty yeah. awesome. And so I hope the public enjoys this clip. Hello, remember me? I'm Isaac Wyman, proprietor of Keene's Wyman Tavern. I was captain of the local militia in 1775. Uh, we mustered right here before marching to Lexington and Concord at the start of the American Revolution. I know that's a bit before your time, but just think for a second. More than two centuries later, you're still surrounded by history. Travel around the Monadnock region and you'll find colonial era churches and meeting houses, beautiful stone and covered bridges, one room schoolhouses, old railroad depots, handsome mills, country stores, not to mention village greens surrounded by century-old homes. History is very much alive here in Cheshire County, giving us a landscape and a lifestyle that's been described as the Courier and Ives corner of New Hampshire. And you know, that didn't happen by accident. It happened because many people who came after me valued our history and took steps to preserve it. I'm Alan Rummerl, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. The Society was founded in 1927, more than 80 years ago, and our mission then and now is collecting, preserving, and communicating the history of Cheshire County. We pride ourselves in being the only countywide historical society in the state of New Hampshire. But what does that really mean? Well, for starters, in collaboration with local historical societies, we are the stewards of the history of 23 towns spread over more than 700 square miles where almost 80,000 people live. Towns and people that encompass a lot of history. Countywide though we are, our 13,000 square foot headquarters is located here in Keene, in the Ball Mansion on Main Street, once the home of an early Keene merchant. Come in, meet some of our volunteers. At the center of our activities is our Wright Research Library where members and guests can find more than 300,000 local history items, including books, manuscripts, maps, photographs, and microfilms to support their research. Valuable resources 
built over many years. But you'll also find extraordinary collections in our display areas at the Wyman Tavern and here in our Climate Control Museum, collections of paintings and prints, pottery and china, glass, toys, and more. The heritage of Cheshire County's past. And upstairs is our exhibit hall, home of the Society's superbly produced presentations on a wide range of historical subjects offered to both Society members and the general public at no charge. And just down Main Street is the Wyman Tavern, once my home and now a museum, open to visitors every summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Its period rooms and also its grounds present a most unique setting for educational programs. And I must admit, I like what they're doing with my old place. There's another facet of our operations that is quite popular, our museum store. Here you'll find a wide selection of books, DVDs, and other items all related to Cheshire County history. Thoughtful gifts for history lovers. History can have some very pleasing consequences. Here are some of ours. The Historical Society of Cheshire County now serves almost 1,000 members, as well as the general public, more than 6,200 attendees at our public programs. Annually, we handle 2,600 research requests, serve more than 1,500 patrons using our research center, and 14,000 visitors to our website. More than 500 children at our educational camps, 800 visitors to the Wyman Tavern, and dozens of collaborations with local Cheshire County Town Historical Societies. We're very proud of that. I was impressed with what my troops accomplished in 1775, but what the society is doing today for history is amazing. So who are my troops? Meet Tom Haynes, Director of Education, Kelly Dickinson, Director of Operations, Kathy Shillimat, Administrative Assistant, and Gail Courier, Operations Assistant. That's our team, but we couldn't do all that without the help of 100 wonderful volunteers who annually contribute more than 3,000 hours of service. And let's not forget our energetic Board of Trustees. I'm Carl Jacobs. By accident of birth, I am descended from people who came to Cheshire County early in the 19th century. That means that on a personal level, the collections and programs of the Historical Society nurture my understanding of this place and who I am. Whether you were born here or arrived yesterday, I'm confident that the Society's programs and resources can do the same for you. And I'd like to add just one more thing about what makes this organization tick. Here at the Society, we talk a lot about the importance of preserving history, because we know that history is a fragile asset. Once it's lost, it's lost forever. But when it's preserved, it's preserved forever a living record of the forces that shaped this beautiful place and the people who live in it. Here in Cheshire County, history has a lot to do with our quality of life, our lifestyle, and we value our history not just as a sentinel to our past, but as a guidepost to our immediate future and to our children's future. Please help us assure that our history lives on. If you are already a member, thank you. If you are not yet a member, Please join us. If we want to leave a valuable legacy to those who come after us, let it be our rich Cheshire County history. Why? Because you, as well as I, are very much a part of it. And trust me, it's nice to be remembered. I'm pretty sure people are going to probably call in and ask to see that video again. I know that you have a whole bunch of artifacts that you, you want to be able to show, but I got a couple of questions about Keene and the surrounding areas. Back in 72, when I came to Keene State, there was trains. I used to see the train three or four times a day. What has the impact, what impact has the trains had on Keene and the Cheshire County area? 
the introduction of the railroad was one of the most important things that ever happened in the history of Keene. The railroad arrived here in 1848 and it really made Keene what it is today, the economic center for the entire region. Before that there were several other towns that were as large as Keene, but after that the businessmen built their industries and warehouses right next to the tracks to take advantage of that inexpensive form of transportation. So it was extremely important economically and it survived. The passenger service survived for 110 years and as you say the freight service was here until the early 1980s but the trains are all gone now. I might say that uh, my uncle Boo Francis Faulkner uh, used to say that the people comment on how Keene is different from Brattleboro in many ways and he said well the difference in the two towns is that Keene was on the Boston and Maine Railroad and Brattleboro <laughs> was on the New York Central <laughs> and the, the two towns have the personality of Boston and New York Another example of how trains have influenced things. And um, being in the military, I've traveled a lot of places. I, I grew up in New England. But as you go to all these small towns, a lot of them have one big church that's usually at the center of the town, and they may have a small one. But when I came to Keene, Keene has a number of churches. you got Catholic, you got Greek, you got Protestants, different types. And it amazes me, you have six, at least six or seven grand structured churches. How did that come to be? Well, it wasn't always that way. To begin with, uh, most towns had one single church when the first settlers came here in the 1700s. It was the Congregational Church. Everyone went to the church or they didn't go to church. Um, it was actually town supported, so you paid taxes to support the church. But when things, when different immigrant groups started to arrive, they brought their own form of religion and their own churches with them. That's why, as you say, there's a Greek church and there's a Catholic church. The French Canadians came down from Canada to work in the mills and in the woods and the forests, and they brought the Catholic faith with them, as did the Irish and other immigrant groups. So that's how Keene ended up with so many churches, because we had so many immigrants from different countries and different parts of the world. And one final one before I let you guys go. Covered bridges. I traveled up to Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and up across the um, northern part of um, New England. They're dying off. They're being destroyed. They're being in disrepair. How, how come that the covered bridges in the Cheshire County area seem to be so well preserved? Again, a little background. Covered bridges were first built in this country in the early 1800s and throughout this region, as you know, in the mid-1800s. Mid and they were covered, first of all, to protect them so that the snow and the rain wouldn't wear away the bed of the bridge and the, where the automobiles, not automobiles, where the wagons <laughs> and the sleighs went through. But they are disappearing because with modern automobiles and trucks, they're not big enough and they can't support them. They're not wide enough. We now have at least two lanes of speeding traffic, so the bridges simply aren't big enough. But in Vermont and in New Hampshire, there are a lot of smaller roads, so that's where the most covered bridges survive. Vermont has over 100 covered bridges still, and New Hampshire has over 50 because we have the back roads. And now people really are realizing that they're part of our architectural heritage and our history, and they're trying to preserve them. So on the small roads in the back towns, they're trying to preserve those bridges and retain them as part of our history and heritage. Unfortunately, sometimes we still lose one to disrepair or an arsonist, but we're really working to preserve those in New England. Yeah, because sometimes when I go to White River Junction, I go up the highway, but I try to go the back way, and you'll see them number 22, number 18, number 17. They're, right. they're, they're well marked. Yes, yeah, they have them all marked for tourists so people actually come to New England to look specifically at covered bridges and they do covered bridge tours. We have six of them surviving right here in southwestern New Hampshire today. It's amazing how much money people will spend to see covered bridges or lighthouses. Yes, we, we don't <laughs> think anything of it because we have them every day, but in the rest of the country they don't have these things. Okay, let's, let's go to some of the artifacts. This, this bright red car. <laughs> this bright red car is a wonderful example of Kingsbury Toys, actually. 
The Kingsbury Company was in Keene, it began as the Wilkins Toy Company in the, about 1890 and survived until the 1940s, the early 1940s. And they began making cast iron toys, trains and fire engines and farm equipment. And these were sold across the country. But Mr. Kingsbury bought out the company soon after. It became the Kingsbury Toy Company and they survived until 1942. This is a late 1920s automobile and just the example of the craftsmanship that you see in this. And many of these toys survived. They were made much better than the toys are made today. And they're wonderful examples. And as I say, they were made by, they were painted by hand and shipped around the country. Not only did they make automobiles and, sh and shift to uh, sheet metal after 1900, but they also made um, submarines and boats and airplanes. So you can really look at the changes in the history of transportation through the toys from the Kingsbury Toy Company, from the old trains and wagons right up to automobiles in the 1940s. They stopped making toys during World War II because they needed the factory for the war effort. And they never went back to toys after the war. We are fortunate to have a wonderful collection of these toys uh, in our permanent collection. They've been donated by the Kingsbury Company and they actually gave us the facilities to uh, present them. So uh, this is just one example of what, probably a hundred that we have? The Kingsbury Fund gave us more than 250 of these toys. So it's one of the best examples for public display and it's, it's wonderful to come and see. You had an exhibit with all these toys last year or the year before? Yeah, a couple of years ago when they first transferred them to us. We told the whole story of the toy company through, through the toys. And uh, that was at our headquarters at 246 Main Street in Keene. And we hope everyone will come there to see our displays and other activities that we do. And on, on the bike path, which is the old train bed, there's a sign talking about the Keene Glassworks. Yes. And, and I go up to Route 9, as, was it the Stoddard Glassworks? glassworks. Right. And so you've got some glassworks? We here? have some examples of those as well. And we have hundreds of pieces of these. This is a Keen flask. The Keen glassworks were in business. And from 1814 to 1853, they began making bottle, uh, they began making window glass here. And then they had a second factory that manufactured bottles. And this happened because of the embargoes during the War of 1812. We could no longer import glass from England and France, so we had to make our own. And Keene was one of the first places that they did that. This is an Eagle flask, and it's a whiskey flask, very common for the time. Uh, Keene made thousands and thousands and thousands of these in the glass factory and shipped them throughout New England. They made many other types of glass. They made ink wells and uh, water bottles and a variety of other things that we have, as I say, on permanent display, about a hundred examples of. And then one of the men who operated the glass factory in Keene, he was a glass blower, bought out the bottle factory when it closed and he took the equipment to Stoddard where he also made glass because there was raw material there, sand, which they melted in the furnace to make the glass and lots of firewood to burn in the <laughs> furnace to keep it over a thousand degrees so they could melt the sand and produce the bottles. And Stoddard was, had um, five factories over 31 years and again they turned out millions of bottles in Stoddard and they're very, very collectible today although they sold them for a few cents then, they're very collectible today. This Stoddard piece on the table right now is a water bottle and one of the Stoddard factories really did very well making bottles for the spas in Saratoga, New York. So the Saratoga Springs purchased their bottles from Stoddard as did Springs in Vermont and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So Stoddard also manufactured glass and we have many of these on display. On this bottle there's a lot of detail writing and stuff. How does that happen? This was before they put paper labels on bottles. You're exactly right. Good to notice that. So they embossed these. That's called embossing. And when they made the mold that they blew these into, they had to have a mold maker who would carve or design the mold so that when you blew the glass in, it would fill in the holes and the words and the designs that you see there. So this was before they could have paper labels, so they wanted something on their bottles. So they put some elements there in the mold. So there was a cast iron mold. The glass blower took just a glob of molten glass and he put it inside there. The mold was closed and then he blew it with lung power to fill out the mold and produce the bottle. So the, these, <clears throat> there were really no plain bottles. Everyone, you almost had an artist to be, and to be able to do this. 
Well, that's right. There were plain bottles, but it was not an easy job, and these men did indeed become glass artists. It was a high-paying job for the time. These men earned quite a lot of money if they were glass blowers, because, it, as I say, it was a difficult job. You really had to learn your trade. And if you're interested in this industrial history, we have recently just opened an exhibit with the Temple Historical Society and the Peterborough Historical Society on the history of the glass manufacturing in New Hampshire. And it's the most comprehensive exhibit of its type ever put together. It is at the Peterborough Historical Society until mid-February. And this, is this a green mug, a nail mug, or what is it? <laughs> <laughs> that is a piece of Hampshire pottery. And the Hampshire Pottery Company was in Keene from the 1870s to 1923. And it was one of the leading art potteries in the country. But when they began, they were simply using clay from the glacial lake bed here in Keene. They used the clay to make uh, pottery and bricks as well. Uh, Mr. Taft began producing this pottery in 1873. He began making bean pots and, and various jugs. And eventually, they transferred to doing this very fine art pottery. And uh, they sold all up and down the East Coast for more than 50 years. And these things are very, very collectible today as well. This is a stein that is in the matte green, which is very collectible from the arts and crafts period of pottery making. You, you were talking about, when, on the film, books and other items that people could buy? Yes. And you have a book that... I do. We have an active museum shop at the Historical Society. And we have dozens of local history items, not only books, but toys and preserves and a variety of prints and paintings. And this book that I have placed here is called Pearly, The True Story of a New Hampshire Hermit, and it is our best seller ever. This is the story of a man who lived in the town of Stoddard from 1888 until his death in the 1970s, and he, he became very famous as a hermit nationwide in the 1960s and 70s, and his story is fascinating. We are in the fifth printing of this book, so that's just one of the dozens of books that we have at the Historical Society. I'll mention one other, which I do not have an example of, because it's at the printer right now. <laughs> this is our newest book. We're trying to do a new publication each year and this is our newest book that will come out on about December 1st by local historian David Proper. And it's a series, a collection of local history articles on all sorts of local history items throughout southwestern New Hampshire. So that should be on the bookshelf of any history lover from this area. The, um, this is about sketches. We have, we have Mount Monadnock and we have some of the other really classical towns. Was Keene in this area the surrounding area a tourist destination much earlier? Keene was at times, and many of the other towns were as well. Um, we were a tourist area because in the mid-1800s, after the trains arrived, people wanted to get out into the countryside. So they would come out from Boston or New York and get out of the city in the summer to get away from the heat and the noise, and they would come out here take the train into Keene, and then they would take a stay, stay at a local hotel, visit Mount Monadnock, or take a stage to one of the grand summer hotels that were located throughout the area on the ponds. And the halfway house on Mount Monadnock is a good example. So people would come to visit this area so they could enjoy nature, go swimming and boating and hiking and fishing. And we have been a tourist area for some time. Now many people come here, as we mentioned already, because of heritage tourism. They want to see the Courier and Ives corner of New Hampshire and the small towns with the colonial meeting houses and the town greens and commons. I might mention that we are getting ready to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Wyman Tavern. And its beginning was as a home for tourists. So not that tourism <laughs> was the same thing in 1752, that it is today, it's amazing to me that people actually walked from here to Boston and yeah. uh, there was no <laughs> railroad and uh, there were horses and, and not really even carriages. But, uh, but this building that uh, is uh, part of our collection uh, will be celebrating its 250th anniversary in uh, 2012. So we're very proud that it's come to us. Uh, in many ways, it's the same building that it was uh, back in uh, 1752. Uh, very exciting to have that. And, uh, very important uh, thing for us to preserve and uh, to bring forward uh, to the future. You mentioned that people walked to Boston, and indeed the soldiers at the beginning of the Revolution walked from the tavern, 23 Minutemen, to Lexington and Concord to support the troops there, and it took them two days to walk to Boston, but they wanted to support the military and the revolutionary cause. 
90 miles, two days. We have a lot of kids who have a tough time going a couple <laughs> of blocks. <laughs> they were used to it. We couldn't do it today, I don't think. I, I may be wrong, but if maybe in the right place, but you, which one of the places? Two years ago, when New Hampshire was talking about <coughs> marriage equality, I hope I don't catch it, but talking about marriage equality, and we were going through and I was doing some research, there was a famous um, Supreme Court decision concerning Dartmouth College and the state of New Hampshire. And when I was doing that research, it was, was it Wyman Tabin that was one of the trustees where the trustees used to meet for Dartmouth College? You are right. Good memory. <laughs> In October of 1770, the first meeting of the trustees of Dartmouth College was held in the Wyman Tavern. So Dartmouth College really got its start so, right there in the North Parlor in Wyman Tavern. The room is there today as the trustees met. <coughs> is it the same as when the trustees met in 1770? So more than 200 years later, they still can say that they can go back and hold another trustees meeting in, in the same place. And... But it was at Lord Dartmouth when, you, when I went back doing the research and stuff. But it was a lot of people don't understand that one of his goals was educating the Native Americans. Right. Yes. The first president of Dartmouth was actually Eliezer Wheelock. And he, one reason that he was out here in the wilderness was to help educate the Native Americans. And for many, many years, you could attend Dartmouth free if you were a Native American and didn't have to pay tuition. <clears throat> okay, so now we, we got some other stuff that, of, of interest that you'd like to be able to show. Some of the things from the store, perhaps? Mm. If you wish. Oh, I remember those as a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> Never our, good at it. <laughs> <laughs> some of our popular gifts in the store um, include colonial toys. So we sell ball and cup toys, such as this one. And You're not going to demonstrate? I'm not going to demonstrate. <laughs> Me neither. I was never. The glass is too close. <laughs> and we have jacks and a, a variety of toys. And these have actually been selling quite well. Uh, I will say they're selling mostly to grandparents who come in during the <laughs> holiday season and say, my grandchildren need to know about this instead of simply all of the video games that they play. You sure it's not the grandparents are buying it for <laughs> they themselves? They may be doing it themselves. <laughs> I bet they try it first, yes. <clears throat> but yeah, you're right. It's amazing how... As a kid, you could spend, I remember playing um, with that, I remember playing baseball cards. Right. It was amazing the stuff that kept you outside, kept you entertained. Instead of being a video game, it may have you on the couch for four or five hours. That's exactly right. And as you say, it was, it was right up to our generation until very recently. But things have changed in recent years. Technological changes. Technological changes are not always good. <laughs> not always, no. <laughs> and... Um, you guys just had a, a big fundraiser, a silent auction, and an auction? Yes. That is the largest fundraising event that we do each year at the Historical Society, and we try to focus on history. We call it our auction of historic proportions. So we have antiques and special opportunities, gift certificates that relate to history, and it is very important for us, and it's a fun time, too. We do it in October every year. We have special food and drink and music and a wonderful evening of fun and fundraising as well. And um, you had talked about in the video about the educational part. Still have um, school trips that kids come in from around? Yes, we had the Waldorf School in last Friday. We have lots of children come in. And education is the most important part of what we do. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and communicate Cheshire County history or share Cheshire County history. So as you can see, we've collected these artifacts over the years and preserved them. But they're not worth a lot if we don't use them to share the history and to educate people. So education is extremely important. We work with the schools all the time. We have school tours in. We go to the schools, but we also work with other nonprofit groups. We go out and give lectures. We do feature exhibits. We do the publications that you see. We're trying to educate people about local history all the time and show them how important that is. That's what we hope that video will do, show the importance of our mission and the fact that if you preserve history, you learn about the past and it will help guide you into the future. I think a, a, a lot of parents as adults, they get older, they think, oh, history's not important, it's boring. But I remember as a kid and even my grandkids, you know, 
you know, went to Plymouth Plantation, went to Mystic Seaport, went to New Bedford Whaling. It's exciting for kids. Kids are really exciting about it. And I think sometimes parents impose their, um, oh, it's boring on the kids. But I've never seen kids not excited about going on those trips. Well, that's good. If, if you approach it the right way and the parents approach it the right way, it is exciting. We're trying to do more living history, yeah. such as those villages and those museums do. So we bring people into the Wyman Tavern and, and try to get them into period. And we dress in period clothing and get them into character to learn about the history by living it. And we found that that's very important. It's a good way to get the children interested. I think we also do a kind of community education where sometimes there's a proposal for something to be built or uh, a change in a, in a structure and they come to the historical society and say, well, uh, how was this building before? And uh, it, history a lot of times can uh, guide us uh, to a way of doing things because we've already experienced it. We know what works and what doesn't. If we look at history, uh, we won't have to repeat uh, some of the mistakes of the past. We can, uh, we can, be, uh, we can build on it rather than uh, just make new uh, errors. So it's, it's good for us in that way. My wife's been born and grew up in, in the Keene area. And just in the, in the past couple of years, this year she went to Wyman Tavern. And it was amazing. Oh, yeah, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And she, she never got around right. to going. And up the road in Franklin Pierce. Went yeah. to Frank. It's like... Who's Frank, for people, who's Franklin Pierce? Franklin Pierce is the only New Hampshire president. Exactly. And it's like, oh, his house is, is right up the road. Right. It's like about 15 miles from downtown Keene. Yes, there's a great deal of history here. And like your wife, many people who live here think they can anytime go to these places. So they don't visit until they have guests in or until they finally get around to it after years and years. And all of that history, if you think about it, is really important to the quality of life that we enjoy here. That heritage that brings in tourists, we take for granted. But we enjoy this region partly because it is so historical and so beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> and the history that we have all around us. I put this... Uh jar here. We, this is one of the symbols that we uh, use a lot. It, it, I'm a gardener, so I understand <laughs> that there's times of the year when the garden is productive, yep. and then if I put things in to uh, uh, preserve them, then it, when times are not so productive, I can uh, sustain myself from the things that I've preserved. Well, I think so it's a good image, I think, for what the historical society can bring. There are things that we are preserving that can sustain us today if we uh, consider them as we make decisions in, in our lives today. The um, going off track a little bit, but historical. The New Keene Middle School. Yeah. They were digging up. They got a number of artifacts back then, and they've been carbon dated and quote. They're really kind of old, <laughs> but but some of the potential dates make them older than the Clovis Indians out west and making a little bit older than the ones they're getting down in like Port Henry in South Carolina. That has, if those ages match up, that has uh, to make keen, it changes everything that we've taught about the migration into, the, into North America. And that's what the archaeologists are telling us, yes. And this is indeed one of the very few oldest sites in New Hampshire that has been found. And we toured the site, the Historical Society staff, and it was just fascinating what the archaeologists were finding there. It is at least 13,000 years old. I don't remember the exact dates. But the Indians, <coughs> the Native Americans, were camping on the shores of what was then the Ashwheelit River and prior to that, a large glacial lake that filled Keene where Keene is today. And these artifacts that they're finding, they're showing us that there were small encampments there over thousands of years, and this is one of the oldest sites in New Hampshire. So we, indeed, we have to look at the history again and try to determine what the true history is. Because, yeah, you got, again, I, my first major was in history. So, yeah, you had the fighting, you had the, the Clovis Indians in the New Mexico, Colorado, which is supposed to be about 11. Then you had the Port Henry right outside of... Um, Paris Island, might of fact, mm -hmm. they found some, and they were arguing back and forth who's the oldest. And you get the Kendison Man, is about seven thousand. Yeah, yeah. I know I pronounced it wrong, but yet yeah, this to me it's just kind of really amazing that this could predate the earliest one by almost two thousand years. Right. 
Yes, and there are several sites in the area that are at least 6,000 years old, but this doubles that. And so it really makes you think about the history of the area. We have been here as European settlers for, what, 300 years now in this area, and they were here 13,000 years ago. So they've been around a long, long time trying to find a way to survive and make a living and live here in New Hampshire, so soon after the glaciers had retreated to the north. So is his historic society going to get a few of the artifacts from No, those will actually be on display in the new middle school. So they're going to use them educationally, which is appropriate. We'll have some lectures, hopefully, on the topic. <laughs> you know, you never know. The Smithsonian may want some. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so if people want to reach you, you've got that. Sure. Yes, so we are at 246 Main Street, right across from the Keene State College campus, and we are open Tuesday through Saturday morning. We're open Tuesday through Friday and then Saturday morning as well. And uh, we now have a staff of four. We have an active research room where people come to do genealogy and local history research. Actually, we get requests, thousands of them, from all, over the, all around the country and all over the world every year, people trying to find their ancestors and, and research our history here in southwestern New Hampshire because we have such good records. Um, we have a website that has some educational activities and items listed, and that is listed on that form as well as our phone number. So if you have a question about local history, please come to us. And we just passed, uh, we just have a, gained a thousand members, <laughs> so we're very proud of that, and uh, we're always uh, room for a thousand and one, <laughs> so uh, glad to have people contact us and join. If you join, you can uh, learn about some of the programs that we have, some of the meetings that we have. We do have a newsletter that we uh, uh, send around so that people can know what we're doing and uh, learn about particular, there's articles in there of interest. So all of that if uh, somebody wants to become a member. And when you talk about family history, you never know what surprises family history. <clears throat> I was just digging up some. My great-great-grandfather was born in Cheshire, England, uh -huh. and he came across <clears throat> on the Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going, I'm not, <clears throat> I was born in Wyoming, Wyoming and now I live in Cheshire County. And it's like weird stuff. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> couple of things. The city of Keene got a grant. They're working on, we're talking about the Arch Bridge. Yes. This, the Stone Arch Bridges, they're really important, unbelievable workmanship. We seem to have a number of them in, in this county that are, are really important. Yes, again, they were amazing craftsmen who built those bridges. Those stone arch bridges were built without any mortar, so it was just by the expert shaping of the arch stones that they stood up, and they stand up today, 150 years later, and they have all been recognized. They're on the National Register of Historic Places because they're engineering landmarks, and the one that you're talking about, the railroad stone arch bridge in South Keene, is one of the highest stone arch bridges in New England, so we want to preserve it and keep it around as part of our heritage and let people enjoy it. Because you sit there and you look at it, even a, as an engineer, and you try to figure out, when you look at the weight of the trains, right. some of the freight trains, and like you said, in the 1980s, they were still going over yeah, that that's bridge. exactly right. No mortar. You say, how can, it do, how can that happen? It's kind of like it's better construction than some of our yes. new, new bridges. Expert craftsmanship. They knew what they were doing, and that's how they had to do it to make it survive. So they knew their trades very well. Then you had the one up on, um, on the way that the started, the double arch. Yes. Yep. And that was kind of wiped out and when we had those big floods. That's right. And it hasn't been repaired the same way. Well, the state has repaired it, and they tried to actually use the same process. They put the wooden cribbing in there and set it down the same way they had originally, I, I hope. That's, yeah. that's what they tell us. But, of course... The craftsmen don't do that every day yep. today. That Stoddard Stone Arch has an interesting history because the selectmen built that in the 1850s with town money, obviously with tax money, because the wooden bridges there kept getting washed away and they wanted <coughs> something stronger. And the townspeople thought that was much too extravagant and that the selectmen spent too much money, so they never re-elected any of them. <laughs> so they <laughs> lost their jobs and the bridge is still so there 150 <laughs> years later. So. The... Um We've got the bridge in, in Keene, the Arch Bridge, but I see a sign, the Cheshire Turnpike. Yes. The turnpikes were some of the 
uh, first really good roads constructed through this area. When the earliest settlers came, they were simply blazed trails, and then they made rough roads. But to start uh, going to the market and taking their produce toward Boston and the larger towns. In the early 1800s, turnpike companies were formed, and those were private companies that built roads and then charged you a fee to travel over them. So we, they needed better roads, but they had to have a way to pay for it. So they built much better roads with their money from their stockholders, and then they charged you a fee to pay, pay that back. It's kind of how much... What's the same is still the same in California and some of the other ones. You have private companies building private roads mm -hmm. that if you don't want to get stuck in traffic, you just pay an extra fee so you can just go flying right by. See, history repeats itself. History yeah. repeats itself. <laughs> so <clears throat> if, if I was new to this area, if I was a visitor traveling, what would be some of the places that you would recommend that, that I stop and, and visit? Not just in Keene, but in some of the surrounding right. areas. Well, obviously, you need to see Mount Monadnock, and it is a landmark that has been important to the residents here since the time of the Native Americans. The Monadnock is an Indian name. You can see it from throughout the region, and it has been an inspiration to people here for thousands of years. The small towns are fascinating because they really show our history. Um, the technology, the industry has not change those towns. You can see the way many of them were 150 years ago. Jaffrey Center is a good example with the wonderful meeting house in Jaffrey Center, built when the Battle of Bunker Hill was raging in 1775. Um, Harrisville is a national historic landmark as the best preserved mill town, industrial town in the country from that period. So Harrisville is a must stop for tourists. Many people don't realize it's even there small towns such as Nelson that was an agricultural village and the town center really hasn't changed in the last 150 years because the farms all the farmers all left and the buildings simply stayed and the barns are gone but their homes are still there and there was no industry no paving no technology to change the village and of course in Keene you have various museums our landmark um, meeting house at the head of the square and so there's just history all around us to be visited when you talk about, the, for example, if we talk about Keene, <clears throat> I see old pictures where you have the trolleys that, that are going through Keene. Some cities are trying to reestablish the trolleys for public transportation. How, when did the trolleys come and how long were they here? The trolley opened in Keene in 1900. So there was a street trolley system with about 25, 26 miles of track. So it ran down Main Street. It went out to Wheelock Park in West Keene. It also went into Swansea to Wilson Pond, where there was a recreation center at the end of the line. So you could go and bowl or dance and so, or shoot there at the recreation center. And it went into downtown Marlboro. So it was where the roads were level, where the trolleys could go. And it was electric trolley. And uh, it was here for 29 years until 1929 when buses took over. It never made much money, unfortunately, but, but it was a trolley system that the kids could take to go to school and people could use to go shopping or to get to work for five cents or 10 cents. Um, the commons, we got the, the circle of downtown in Keene. Yes. Did, I remember the Boston commons and some of the biggest city did that function as a common, or it's just it kind did. of a wreck area? No, it did. It was common land, and that's where the word comes from. It was a piece of land that the town kept, and all of the residents could use in common. So they could take their sheep there and pasture them there. The meeting house was usually there. They would put a cemetery there, but it was to be used by the local people. Boston Common was the same thing. I um, mean, Keene has its common, and many of the small towns have larger commons, which is the way they were originally for town use. And um, we, we can't talk about Keene without talking about the hospital mm -hmm. before it um, became part of Monadnock. You got, what is it, Elliott Hall, which is now part of the um, Keene State College. Correct. But that was a pretty important um, facility for the community and surrounding area. It was extremely important. In the 1800s, there was no real good hospital. A couple of doctors tried to start private hospitals, but they were never too successful. So in 1892, that building, now Elliott Hall, was given to the city 
of Keene to be used as a hospital and the town took it over and set up a hospital which was extremely important for the town because they hadn't had such a thing. People had not had the type of care they could get in a hospital and it was located there until the early 1970s. I was born in that building. So was I. <laughs> My wife was born in that building too. <laughs> And if I go into the surrounding areas, there's a lot of dairy farms. Yes. Was there, is that a new one or has they been for a long time? Most of the dairy farms that we have now have been around a long, long time. The first settlers here came for agricultural purposes. They came to farm the land. And dairy farms became very important in the last half of the 1800s, early 1900s. We had thousands of farms. Most towns had a hundreds of farms in the mid-1800s. That's how people survived. That's what they did for work. And they would sell the excess after their family used what they needed. And then they started selling the milk as well. And they did this in bulk. And when the train arrived, it allowed them to send the milk to Boston, to the large processing plants. And they could do it overnight or in a few hours so they didn't have to worry about the milk spoiling. So that's why the dairy farms became so important. Keene doesn't really have any active commercial farms anymore. I remember several when I was young, but there are still quite a few up and down the Connecticut River Valley on the best farmland that we have in the River Valley. One of the things we have in the uh, museum store is a depiction of Beach Hill uh, in Keene around the turn of the 20th century and it's basically all cleared land. Uh, I think at that time uh, the land was, what, about 90 percent cleared land because of the dairies and the, the agriculture. And, of course, you can, I mean, it doesn't take much of an <laughs> of a eye to see that most of that land now has gone to forest. Right. Uh, it, the, the farms just couldn't compete with the, with the land that exists farther west. And once the trains and the, exactly. the good transportation came in, the, the better land was able to uh, be more... Uh, competitive with the, with the farms here. Yeah, because most people don't realize that New Hampshire was almost laid bare from forests. Yes. It, it has more forests now than it did 200 years ago when it's right. all new growth. That's right, yes, because it was all cleared for agricultural purposes. And another part of that was the sheep craze in the early 1800s when they started sheep farming with all of the new textile mills, the brand new technology. They were sending the wool to the textile mills in Keene at the Colony Mill, uh, Faulkner and Colony Mill in Harrisville and Lowell and Boston. So they cleared the land to uh, pasture their sheep and built all of those stone walls at the same and, time. Uh, that was the next thing I was going to bring up. You were talking about the, the picture behind us, which is Peg Shop Road, and you have a picture <coughs> of um, the stone wall. Exactly. New Hampshire had to pass a law because People are just doing away with stone walls. Right. Or if I live in Connecticut or New York and I wanted a nice stone wall in front of my house, I would just come up to New Hampshire and buy it. Unfortunately, that's what was happening. So the state has stepped in to try to preserve those stone walls. They're part of our heritage, too. They laid those all up. They built them mostly during the sheep craze, and we want to preserve them as part of the history. <clears throat> and so we, we've covered a great deal during this time. What is some, what, I'll give you each an opportunity. What do you like most and what would you try to convince people? What do I like most about the historical society? Yeah. As I said, the, the fact that we are preserving knowledge and uh, skills that uh, are applicable today, that uh, the history has a lot to, to teach us and a lot to uh, enlighten us uh, in our lives. And uh, so I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that and to to work at uh, the preserving of those things. And uh, do you have young people working with you, say from the college or other places? Because a lot of times people say, oh, historical society is just for old people. We have interns, yes, and volunteers from the schools and from the college. We have students who come in and earn credit to do work for us. I have an intern from Franklin Pierce right now who's helping me put together our next feature exhibit. So yes, we try to get them interested at an early age. And so, yes, you've been, your, your great grandmother got you involved. And so, yeah, you, you're a little biased, but <laughs> how would you convince someone else to, to get involved and the importance of getting involved? I think the important part of it, we mentioned the mission to collect, preserve, and communicate. And the most important thing to me is sharing this and communicating it. That's why I enjoy the education and the teaching and to show people how important our history is um, so they can um, use that to move into the future and help 
preserve it, to enjoy our quality of life in this region. I love the research and the writing and the sharing and the teaching and helping people to get interested in what we have. It's not old, boring, dusty stuff, but it can make a difference in your life. And as with any nonprofit, you always have that money-raising problem. You rent out some of your facilities at, at times for functions, right? We do. We um, rent out space in our facility on Main Street at 246 Main Street, and our exhibit hall is one of the nicest spaces in town, but not enough people know about it. We rent it out. We have a low rate. We are now doing some weddings there and lots of meetings, and we're renting the space, and it's a great space to come and have a meeting. So, yes, look into that on our website as well. And people are also doing things at the Wyman Tavern from time to time. Correct. Uh, especially the outdoor uh, aspect of the tavern with the... Uh, it's a beautiful spot, and uh, the history of the tavern is a, is a nice uh, addition to some other kinds of events. What, what is the facility right, right across the street from the post office? That is the Horatio Colony okay. House Museum, and that is also a type of period house museum. Mr. Colony left that to the city, and there's a separate trust that operates that, so it is showing his collections as they were in his house when he was living there. It's a wonderful space to visit. So we're down to the last minute. I want to thank both of you for coming. And I think we have to do this again. Yes. There's more stuff that's involved. And so to everyone, again, thank you. And this is um, Chris Roberts signing out. Hope we'll see you on the long road. And who, hopefully we'll be able to get some more and better get <laughs> I always plug it up. Better <laughs> guests in the future. Thank you.